On February 10th, 2025, Boom Supersonic conducted its second supersonic test flight on their XB-1 experimental aircraft platform. Now, this is a huge deal because it's the first time a civilian company has broken the sound barrier over American soil. And I think it ushers in an age that we probably didn't think was possible, one where we could fly around on commercial jetliners at supersonic speed. And there's some really interesting insights that I just learned from watching their live stream. So let's see if we can't figure out just how impactful this is going to be. I'm Ricky, and this is Tuba Da Vinci. This video is brought to you by Delete Me. So first of all, this is the Boom XB-1. It is a one-third scale demonstrator. Now the X means experimental. It's one of the most amazing letters in aviation. It means that this platform is a demonstrator to showcase some new capability. In this case, flying supersonic without making a sonic boom. And we'll get back to that here in a second. Now, this aircraft was flown by Boom's chief test pilot, Tristan Geppetto Brandenburg, who has a history of Navy aviation, just a man after my own heart. And he flew today on the second flight up to speeds of Mach 1.18 over the Mojave Desert. Now, this flight happened in the Mojave Desert in a very hollowed grounds in aviation, the Bell X-1 supersonic corridor, named after the Bell X-1, a rocket-powered aircraft that first took flight back in 1946 and ushered in an age when mankind, when humankind, first broke the sound barrier. Now, one of the amazing parts of this story is the company CEO, Blake Scholl, here on the left. He was a computer science major and a software developer, and he, after selling this company, he decided, I know, let's start a supersonic aviation company. So this is kind of a man after my own heart, and... Many thought he would never be able to pull this off because, I mean, again, historically, supersonic flight was the Concorde, the Tupolev, of course, in Russia, and military aircraft. In fact, the last new clean sheet design aircraft that broke the sound barrier was back in 2007, and it was the F-35. So it's been a while of any variety, let alone a civilian aircraft. Now, along with the CEO, Blake Scholl, there's also the chief flight test engineer, Nick Sharika, who's a part of both live streams, and he brings a great actual bit of background. So interestingly, Nick is not only a chief flight test engineer, he's also a landing gear engineer, two things that I actually both used to do for the Navy. So it's kind of a man after my own heart. This whole team is pretty amazing. With just 50 people, they went from kind of an idea concept to raising funds to actually building this demonstrator, a one-third scale prototype. Now, in a kind of a sad twist, this is the last time the XB-1 will fly. So it's done all of its flight testing, gathered all the data, it'll go home, allow the engineers to be able to digest it all and see how closely all their models, FEA, and simulation data matches what the aircraft actually did. Now, breaking the sound barrier is complicated and challenging for a plethora of reasons, especially in the transonic region when you break the sound barrier, some of the controls change, airspeed going into the engine, and so much more. But this is a really exciting moment for aviation after we've had some really heartbreaking news the last couple of weeks here with different plane crashes around the world and uh, the, the ones in D.C. and Philly, for example. So this is a little bit of exciting news. And it's also refreshing to see that we have some ambition in aviation. Really, airplanes kind of all look the same. When I show my boys different aircraft over the years, they kind of think they all look the same. And that's refreshing to know that we're entering a new golden age where we might be able to see this. I want to show you one of the things I found particularly interesting about this flight test. It's this idea here that you can see in this diagram of a inaudible wave. So this is a no boom supersonic flight. And this is a interesting combination of factors in physics that says that at the right airspeed, depending on the temperature, right, airspeed and, and temperature and altitude, you could potentially be in a position where you're making shock waves, right, the sonic boom, but actually have these waves reflect and refract off of the air in such a way that there is no sonic boom below a certain threshold. A lot of the topics we cover are counterintuitive or not immediately obvious. You know what's really not obvious? How exposed your personal information is online. It's why I've been a member of our sponsor, Delete Me, for two years now. Delete Me is a hands-free subscription service that'll remove all your personal information that's being sold online. And it's not just a one-time scan. Just look at all these listings that have been reviewed each quarter and how the amount of exposed data is going down over time. I just got my eighth quarterly report and Delete Me has scanned over 2,300 listings. And it's just amazing to see how the amount of data being exposed just keeps going down over time. And remember, Delete Me isn't just for you. There's family plans so you can protect your entire family and keep all of their data safe because we all have a lot on our minds and your privacy probably doesn't come up very often. It's why I let Delete Me stay vigilant and do all the work so I don't have to think about it. Have you ever heard the expression, if something is free, you're the product being sold. 
So join Delete Me and save 20% on all plans with my code Ricky. Links in the description. Huge thanks to Delete Me and you. Now back to the show. Now in this particular flight, they're flying around 35,000 feet and they were saying that that cutoff threshold was about 7,000 feet. And now this is a function of the differences in how light and sound waves, both pretty similar, bend based on the medium that they're flowing through. So if you ever take a pencil and a cup, that's the example that Blake Scholler, CEO mentioned, and you put that pencil in the cup of water, you'll see the cup and pencil seem to bend. And that's because water and glass all have different angles of refraction of light. In this example, it has to do with two pretty complex factors. One is the temperature of the air, which, you know, the higher the temperature, the lower the pressure, the more spread out the air molecules are. And also the fact that the higher up you go, the less air density there is. There's just less air molecules to contend with. So using these kinds of factors, they're able to predict and pr uh, produce an envelope where they can fly at certain speeds, right, between Mach 1 and 1.3 and make no audible sound wave on the ground. So they th did this three times today and three times last week, showing how they could unlock a whole new set of routes over land. Previously, they were showcasing 4,000 nautical miles and all the different routes you can fly over oceans, right? But this unlocks a whole new ability to travel from like LA to New York, for example, and do so without making sonic waves. And finally, one of the other things they really wanted to accomplish with the second flight test is to produce Schlieren imagery, which is a cool visualization of what you can't actually see with your eye, but it goes and shows you the differences in air density, and it can actually show you how the shockwave forms over aircraft. So yeah, here's some different examples of those visualizations. This is the one that they showed, but you can kind of see the differences in air density, right? So as that shockwave forms, you're compressing air and you can actually visualize it this way. So this data is not out yet, but they will have that available as a result of this flight test. One of the key takeaways from all of this is that they're one week away from being design frozen on the Overture airframe. The Overture is their actual production intent model. It'll be what they sell to United and to American Airlines. And they're one week away from being final on design. By March, they're planning a design freeze for the Symphony engines, and they're going to have thrust testing and actual engines ignited by the end of this year. And they'll start building the Overture in 18 months and roll it off the line in three years, put it in the air in about four years or so, and have passengers by the end of 2029. Now, one of the points that people have made online is why make a new airframe if it doesn't even go as fast as a Concorde? That's interesting because the Overture also carries less people, about 60 people, 64 people or so, compared to the Concorde's 100-ish, depending on configuration. But to understand why, you have to combine both engineering and economics. You have to remember that a Concorde ticket cost $20,000 back in the 80s. That was a lot of money back then, probably about double that today in today's money. But it was also that there wasn't as much business travel as there is now. Boom's goal is to have tickets for the Overture be around $5,000, which is about the cost of a business class seat in most flights overseas. So they're going to be much more cost competitive. Also, if you have 100 seats in a Concorde and you have to sell them all to make profit and you're flying at half capacity, it becomes harder to fly routes. And that's ultimately what resulted in you know Air France and uh, British Airways canceling their flights and grounding the aircraft is they just had a hard time making flights that made sense and made money. So I wanted to show you something. Here's some data that I've dug up. So if you see here, I did some calculations for some different aircraft. This is the Boeing Dreamliner, one of the most efficient passenger planes out there right now. This is the massive Airbus A380, the number of passengers that it holds. And then there's the Concorde and the Overture. Then I found out all the fuel burn rates per hour and then the maximum speed limit, of course, for the two subsonic airplanes is about 567 miles per hour. And then factoring the distance, which is basically limited by the Overture. So just flying a distance of 4,000 miles for all four planes. First of all, you can see the Concorde would win the day with a travel time of about 3.1 hours. The Overture is right behind with about 3.5 hours. And then there's the fuel burn. And as you can see, the fuel burn per passenger is absolutely massive. Now, I couldn't find data for the actual fuel burn rate for the Symphony engines for the Overture. So what I did is I kind of extrapolated based on the number of passengers and the weight. And I just used what they had for the Concorde. But odds are, I would imagine this number is going to be significantly less than this. I mean, that's all that time and development that are spending on the symphony should result in a better uh, value there. And then finally, this is the fuel cost. 
and then the cost per ticket, right? If you factor about a thousand dollars for the traditional aircraft, twenty for the Concorde, and five thousand, you'll kind of see the profit. So, first and foremost, if you compare the profit for the overture based on fuel burn rates, and now this again might be lower if they can get that fuel cost down, but it's going to be a very profitable airplane to fly. It falls between a Dreamliner and an A380. Again, at full capacity. And this gets, I think, to why this is a genius move. They didn't go break records. What they, I think what they found is, based on material science and limitations, they could hit Mach 1.7 more consistently and more easily without having to reinvent the wheel for new materials. And you know, on the engine design side, as, as well as the sonic boom and mitigation for the sound and shock waves, and also the airframe. So they found a speed that would be significantly faster than what we fly at today, right? About twice as fast and found a design and platform to make it profitable. And that's something the Concorde just never was. Also take a look at this. Here's what it looks like in flight. Here's the amazing boom team at the telemetry stations on the ground. Uh, this In this particular flight, by the way, they had some telemetry issues. They had some dropout in the data. So they had to call knock it off and, and, and you know, come out of the, uh, the Mach 1 region and come back down to subsonic and return to the patterns. But you can see here, I think they broke about Mach 1.18 at its best. But if you see it come to land, it was just a really amazing moment. First of all, there's a couple things you'll notice. First of all, is the high angle of attack. This is how far up the nose is. This is pretty traditional for supersonic aircraft because supersonic aircraft are built for really high speed, right? Because they're traveling at higher speeds. So the wings are swept further back and they produce less lift. You'd have to have a higher angle of attack to be able to bring it in for landing. Now, one of the ways that the Concorde solved this was a nose that actually had mechanical actuation and moved downward, give the pilot a view of the runway. But what Boom is gonna do is actually have cameras and sensors to be able to give you kind of a augmented reality in the pilot's cockpit to be able to make that easier and have no moving parts. If you can get rid of moving parts, it's always better. That's one less piece that can jam up or seize or anything else. But as it comes, yeah, as it comes to land, you can kind of see some of the cool qualities and characteristics about it. Such a cool plane. So they've simplified things. They've taken away all the key things. And I think they've bolted it down to a platform that can be profitable. That's something the Concorde, as much as we love it, just wasn't. It was never a profitable operation. British Airways and Air France, the two large carriers of it, both had to eventually retire it because it wasn't profitable. So I think what they've done here is kind of genius. I think they've figured out a way to seat 64 people, which is basically all business class seating, and fly people in half the time, which is the ultimate luxury. And with the level of business travel in the world today, I think they would absolutely sell these out, and it would be um, it would be a very profitable operation to run. Also, 4,000 nautical miles, which will be about the target for its maximum range, should be well in range of most of Europe from the East Coast, which is one of the most popular routes, I think, that they're going to fly. And with that quiet boom technology where they can actually cruise without making shockwaves, they'd be able to fly from the East Coast of the U.S. to the West Coast of the U.S. as well. That's really that's really exciting and interesting. It opens up new markets, right? If you're going to buy these airplanes, first of all, you have to be profitable after spending millions and millions of dollars in flight testing and validation and final production. You have to sell these. And to make them profitable and lucrative, you have to be able to have the wide variety of routes that you can operate on. And I think they're going to achieve that. Now, I actually reached out to Boom and I, was, I might have potentially had a chance to visit them today in Mojave and see their flight test. But I was supposed to go to CERN in Switzerland and our whole team got sick. My boys were sick and we had to cancel, so I couldn't make it. But I've reached out to them and I'm going to go visit them, see their factories and see some of the development on the Symphony engine. That's one of the big parts of the story because the one concern that I had is when I heard they were building their own engines, I was thinking, okay, that sounds really ambitious. Like it's enough to build a brand new aircraft platform that breaks the sound barrier and is ready to carry passengers. That alone is ambitious enough. But now if you want to be an, a jet engine manufacturer as well, that sounds really, really ambitious. I made a video about a company called Elio Motors back in the day. It was this unique two-person car that was supposed to get like 90 miles per gallon. This is before the, the rise of electric vehicles. And I think what kind of did them in is they decided not to get like a Honda or Toyota little three-stroke engine, but build their own. And the cost of that development just eventually kind of sunk them. And 
traditionally, I'm opposed to that. But it sounds like they've made some really big progress. And again, if you could have everything in-house, that vertical integration is the holy grail. And it sounds like they've done it because they're supposed to be frozen with the design. They're supposed to have a final design in the next month or two. So I'm really looking forward to going out and seeing it, talking with the engineers and figuring out what they've done here. Because interestingly, they're going to have four engines. Normally on an aircraft, you want to go higher bypass. So if you look at like a picture of a... Uh... So normally what you want is a high bypass ratio, which is the amount of the size of the fan versus the size of the compressor region. And so that high bypass gives you more efficiency. Now this works for slower aircraft like this, but this massive frontal area would be a big problem for a supersonic airplane. And so instead of larger engines and less of them, you've noticed that, you know, we used to fly in quad engine planes over, over oceans, and now most of them are just dual engine. Now that's gonna be quite different because the Overture is gonna have four engines. You can even tell there's quite a bit going on here, even the angle that they're sitting at and the fact that they're smaller and there's more of them. I'm really, really curious to know about the Symphony engine and what sort of engineering has gone into it, how you delay the airspeed to be subsonic, even though the travel of the aircraft is supersonic. That's normally a thing that engines have to do. You saw some of the hoods and scopes on the XB-1, and uh, that'll be interesting to see. Also, as I mentioned, even if this got the same fuel efficiency per person as a Concorde, it's profitable. It's actually right in the realm of 787 and 8380 at full capacity, which is pretty rare again. But if they can get that fuel burn down even further, that would be amazing. And that's kind of what I want to learn more about. This is a really monumental moment in aviation. Aviation is hard. In the live stream from the team, they mentioned that they've been working on this for about seven years. This And this is just the experimental demonstrator. There's still years to go. 2029 is four years from now before we'll actually be able to get on one. But this is the nature of what engineering takes. It takes years and years of dedication to go back to the same little part to keep testing and refining, coming up with a flight pattern. I remember this from my Navy days because I actually used to do flight testing for the Navy on the F-18 program. And then I went on to do a little bit of landing gear work and flight controls. It's in some of the most amazing work I've ever done, some of the funnest I've ever done, and I miss it. And I'll be honest, when I watch videos like this, I kind of want to take a step back. If there was something that I would do to leave the YouTube channel and go back to, it would probably be something like this, really amazing. And you can not never underestimate the power and value of inspiring people, right? This is like the space race. We went to the moon. That was such a moment. Everybody looked up together at the same place and thought, wow, we can go there. And it brings people together and it inspires the next generation of engineers and people going to, to school, right? Even trading and, and trades people, right? Machinists, tool makers. There's such a wide variety of people that you need to do something like this. And uh, while SpaceX and more recently Blue Origin is launching rockets, which is really visually striking, this is equally exciting stuff. Plus, in the next couple of years, we might be flying overseas on an overture and breaking the sound barrier, which is pretty amazing. So bravo, boom, supersonic team. Really amazing day, really amazing progress that you guys have made. Even the live stream quality, the fact that they have a T-38 as a chase plane with Starlink on board, giving us these kinds of visuals in real time and just telling everybody what was going on. I'll put a link to the live streams you can watch. It's really insightful and really amazing. And I can't wait to learn more from it. All right, that's a quick look at the progress happening at Boom Supersonic. And if you thought that video was cool, check out this video next. Until next week, I'm Rico Tupi Da Vinci. Thank you so much for watching.